We're live. Let's just see if the sound from desktop is coming across. If somebody says something intelligent. Intelligent. That's something that's, intelligent. <laughs> it did come across. <laughs> Apparently, there's something like this. There's, there's a difference in terms of, like, my sound and the and the and the uh, meat sound. So, I uh, my sound is is way uh, yes, more silent. But anyway. It is what it is, folks. Uh, we are going to dive into automated tests. And if anybody has some background noise, they might want to mute themselves while, uh, if not speaking. Uh, that would be great, actually. All right. How is everyone doing? You guys doing fine? I just said, mute yourself, and then I ask a question, right? <laughs> It's a yeah, it's a trick uh, exercise. <laughs> it is doing doing good, doing good. All right. Uh, I'm good, just tired again. Just tired. Okay, okay. Well, hopefully you will get even more tired after this one. Let's talk about test automation, and we're gonna do some um, some stuff both in Ruby and in JavaScript. Not because we're going to do be, become Rubyists. I actually left out uh, Python this time around because A, I'm not super good at Python, and B, testing in three languages can be uh, can be a bit tricky. We, we might get back into that at some other point, but today let's focus on JavaScript and Ruby, just to show off some concepts. Not because you um, you uh, you necessarily have to to be to test in Ruby so much but uh, it's not a bad thing to uh, see the similarities between various testing frameworks. But before we get into testing, this will be a, th uh, a, a mix of theory and practice. Let's cover some theory first. And again, if you're watching this on, on uh, Twitch or on YouTube, this is session four of the Work to Web uh, community training program from Agile Ventures, and we will we are covering a lot of topics that are related to um, um, to to develop software development uh, in general, but web application development in particular. And today it's about testing. All right. So uh, again, as usual, I just want to point you to this tell, show, practice, reflect uh, um, schema, which is like a protocol for for how we do things. Uh, so don't forget to always reflect uh, on how will this new piece of information fit into your workflow or your your overall palette of tools or skills or and how can this make you a better uh, better developer if ever and again everything I say is highly opinionated uh, because uh, that's the way I roll uh, it's 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 my these are my ideas, and hopefully I can inspire you to uh, to include some of these things that I talk about into your own workflow if you think that the, 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 this can make you a better developer. And if not, then not. Then you we spend two hours together and hopefully enjoy that one way or another. And talking about two hours, I noticed that I notoriously go over time on those one, one and a half hour sessions. So... I just prolong this one to two hours. Um, and if we, you know, that's a very pragmatic approach to things, to life. Uh, and if two hours is too much, then we just cut it down to an hour and a half. You know. Unless, because you know you have two hours, it becomes two hours and 30. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully we don't do that. Hopefully we don't do that. Um, that's, a, that's an interesting view. Yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's follow this carefully and see if that's where we end up. Um, God, let's hope not. Anyway, let's move on. No, 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 no two and a half hours. Last time around, we spoke a lot about Agile methodologies and the main principle that guides Agile teams is working software. That is the primary measure of progress. But the question is, of course, how do we know? How do we know if software actually works? Well, we test software while one way or another. And testing can either be done by you, the team, which is uh, a good solution, I would say, or it can be tested by your users. 
and that could be a very disappointing experience for your users and it can also be an extremely stressful experience for you the development team it can be a very costly thing it can be a very time consuming thing so if there's anything you take away from this talk and this is slide three i guess uh, that is that whatever you do even if you totally ignore what i'm saying about automated tests and all of that stuff please just make sure that tests that that you don't use your end users as testers because it's a really shitty thing to do uh for for many perspectives um so testing is always done your software will be uh, subject to tests one way or another it's it's and it's up to you to decide um where that testing actually happens so let's talk about the very simple the simplest thing that you can do as a beginning beginner programmer let's say you start with a hello world in um in 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 javascript or in ruby or in python or whatever how do you know that your your code actually works well you spin it up right you execute your code and you see if the result is actually hello world in your terminal or in your in your browser or whatever and that is uh, that is manual testing like you actually execute your code and you see if the result is what you desire it to be uh, and there's really not much not much else to it that's that's how manual testing works uh, in its very at its very core in many organizations there are speci special people who test you um, who test software uh, developers develop software and testers test software and they do historically uh, manual testing which basically means that the developers d uh, develop and then deploy something to to live servers and then the other department kicks in and, and starts to uh, click around fill in information uh, process data and they have some protocols and they take notes on what works what doesn't work and so on it's a process where tests are executed manually by somebody that often bears the title of qa quality assurance analyst uh, and they can be experienced testers tested professionals that know how to do things they generally know quite a bit about development and programming but they are not programmers they don't have to be programmers in any way they have to understand how how uh, how user interfaces work how how certain types of software like costu uh, con uh, consumer or customer relationship management or erp systems or invoicing system work and so on uh, and they do they basically cl click around and they use the system uh, one way or another time consuming and and costly of course uh, but very relevant in many, many cases extremely relevant and i just have to say a disclaimer at this stage that uh, if, even though i am a great propagator of automated testing i do not claim that manual testing is unnecessary because it is it is, it is really relevant um, although the protocols for that could 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 probably be amended from from having a separation between the develop developers and the, and the testers and and so so what is test automation so in in automated test software testing the testers which can be the same people as as the ones performing manual tests instead of clicking around and using the software they can write automated scripts that does it do, do, do it for them right uh, because they want to execute the test test execution or, or or automated text execution and that saves them a lot of time especially if they have sent off code for revision uh, they tried a feature once it wasn't working and then they get it back from from the developer team uh, after a week or two weeks or what have you and they want to to rerun the same test it's it's more secure if they if that is automated right uh, and you can use different types of automation tools to develop these test scripts and also validate the software uh, and the goal in that protocol of course with automated tests versus manual tests is to complete this execution uh, faster and equals less with you know with less costs 
So test automation could be used by by test testers or or QA people uh, parallel with manual testing, of course, right? But this is quite interesting now. So if we can automate these these tests, and if we can run scripts to do that, perhaps we can, you know, not only lower the amount of manual testing, but in principle, uh, remove that totally from the equation, which is again not something that I propagate but, uh, or promote because I do think that they are relevant. But we can lower the amount of manual tests to a ver very minimum. And if we can automate the testing, what, it, what do we really need to separate the development from the testing? Couldn't we like kind of integrate that to have the same teams? not only develop software, but also test software. And in principle, if that is the case, that we can develop and test at the same time, could we also switch this around? Could we write, write tests first and then develop and use tests as a requirement documentation in terms of specifications and, and, and what, what the developers should, should, uh, uh, should build? These questions, have led to to uh, emerge of uh, another paradigm and another way of, of, of writing software that is often referred to as test-driven development, uh, which is something that you guys probably heard about and that I believe is a, a very good way to, to write software, but not the only way, of course, uh, I would say. So test-driven development, or TDD as, they oft, as we often abbreviate it, is the process of using automated tests not only to tests, test the software, but to actually drive the design process of software, which is a, a totally different idea than just testing afterwards. And, you know, put simply, the main concept, concept is to write a test first as a desired behavior, as a desired vision of the future. This is what I want my, my piece of software to do. And then implement just enough code to satisfy that specific test or set of tests. And then make that test go, go green, of course. And then look at your, your code implementation, leave the tests as they are, and tweak your implementation so it becomes more modular, following better best practices, doing all of this this stuff that comes with professional development, uh, so that it 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 actually lives up to good standards, right? And and that is kind of turning the the process of writing software and then testing it afterwards upside down, and makes use of automated tests not only to validate the software, but again to make design decisions and and uh, um, and drive that process forward and I I really really enjoy uh, test driven development I think it works for me but it takes a lot of time and a, and a lot of practice to get used to that fact and I uh, also want to make another disclaimer that I'm not so fascist about this right I would say that you know if you fail to write the test first or you write a test that proves not to be covering all the test edge cases or, or corner cases and you actually write a few tests after you wrote wrote a, uh, a piece of implementation i personally wouldn't execute you uh, there are tdd uh, evangelists or real fascists that would say that oh that's really bad practice and so on for me personally i am a very pragmatic guy i rather have tested software uh, than not tested software, right? Because I do believe that tests are good for, for, for a project. But if I get to choose uh, no tests versus like really strict TDD and not making any progress, I would say test afterwards, test whenever, just as long as you do test your, your code. So you understand? So, so even if you don't use tests to drive the design process, at least write automated tests so we can, we can uh, have uh, we can make sure that everything works uh, together and so on. I'll be talking more about that later, but I think I gave you guys at least a, 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 an introduction to the difference between uh, having tests done manually and automated in an automated way by a different department uh, versus TDD 
uh, that basically brings the, the testing uh, to the developer team and integrates that in the development process. Uh, so it is an addition to your workflow, if you choose it to be, right? Uh, it, it, it can become a very important or play a very important role in the process of, of designing your software and, and verifying uh, its functionality. In my opinion, TDD prevents a lot of bugs in production code, much more so than having this separation between developers and testers that has been a traditional separation. I, I think if you do it inter integrated in your process, in your development process, you do prevent a lot of bugs to make, into, make it into production. And it reduces a, 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 a lot of tedious work during the development process. Now, it depends, of course, what you, how you define tedious work, but uh, I think that um, making sure from scratch that your software behaves the way you want it to behave uh, reduces a lot of uh, nonsense work uh, and a lot of waste, time waste. So um, I would say it's, it's a very good thing. But having said that, it does introduce a totally new layer uh, of work into your, your workflow. So it requires you to learn more about, uh, about test automation, of course, and about new tools and so on. So it is quite often by beginner programmers con perceived as, a, as, a, as an obstacle. Do I really need to test this? I just want to hack away and I just want to, uh, to, to code away and, and push out features. And I totally understand and sympathize with that, with that um, uh, sentiment in, the, in this, this way of thinking. But I do believe, I strongly believe that in the long run, it is much better for, for everyone uh, on an individual basis, but also on a team level and a project level to embrace the fact that all software needs to be tested sooner or later. And it's much better to do it sooner uh, when you actually develop the, 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 the thing. Any, any thoughts on this so far, people? Um, I guess just that uh, it makes a lot of sense to me. I guess at the beginning, when you start coding, you don't really get it. <clears throat> Up until the moment when you realize how much manual testing it uh, takes you to to actually properly test uh, that everything still works when you have made a change. And uh, yeah, that's uh, I guess that's also the problem I was having with MetaMask where you, you, you jumped in. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so, so that's a, that's a little bit of a keyword there. A very interesting insight there, Anya. I should probably have had a had a slide about a slide about this. So, testing or a TDD can can help you validate that the so, that software works the way it is intended to work. But then, as you move forward in the in your project, and you add new layers of functionality and so on, it it is also capable of validating that it still works. I, I really enjoy that that uh, that thing because it's, there's a difference between working and then still working, right? Uh, because because that is often the case that when you start working on some new stuff, new functionality, you know, making it a little more complex, then the shit hits the fan. You break everything else uh, because of some you know whatever it is, database, uh, uh, new database structure or new code structure or whatever. So that it still works is really relevant, actually. Uh, Thomas. Yes. Um, is is there is there a difference between the terms test driven driven development and behavior driven development? So it's called behavior driven design, but but yes, there is a uh, there is a difference. They they often overlap and they or they go hand in hand. So. Test-driven development is a, is a process of how or when you write your test and implementation code, whereas behavior-driven design is a, a paradigm that focuses on what sort of features you are actually looking at in the beginning and how you work your way through the entire process. Um, there are m two main main ways of designing software, I would say. 
a little simplified you start with an with an idea a unit for instance an algorithm or or a, a function and then you work your way outwards to implement it in in terms of a user interface right so this is an inside out approach so you work with with components and then you work you know closer and closer into the 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 place where the users are up, uh, actually interacting with your code or you turn this around which is bdd where you start working in the in the in the interface layer and work yourself into the the system right so it's a it's an outside in approach i will actually be talking about that in in uh, in uh, hour and a half approximately no an hour because i have a, sch a schematic about that so but bdd and and TDD they go hand in hand, but they do not cover the same things. Again, test driven development is a is a process in itself, whereas the the BDD approach is how you focus or what you focus on uh, at any given time. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you. All right, good stuff. Thomas, I also have a question. Go uh, ahead. Maybe it's more pragmatic. So when we are starting with the tests, right? And making, like starting with coding the features that are gonna be then coded afterwards, right? Mm -hmm. How specific do you want to be in the tests and how how broad, for instance, do I want to test every single HTML tag that's gonna go in versus a response or something like that? I'm not sure. First of all, if that's feasible, if you if you can do that, because it's very time consuming, I, I can imagine. And second, um, if it actually adds any value testing every single individual piece, or you should do a more broad test, something like that. Because sometimes when I think about it, I feel like I'm going to spend a lot of time testing something, and there are always going to be these edge cases, and there are always going to be these kind of questions. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know that's a that, that's that. a that's a very very int very good question uh, Pedro actually I, I think you you just hit the, the nail uh, on this one look uh, there is no given answer to this I would say two granular testing is not good uh, you said a few keywords in your in in formulating your question uh, I think value is is a keyword here if the test actually brings value to 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 the overall experience then it's definitely relevant right there might be html tags that are super important to 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 see and then there are others that are not right so i wouldn't test for everything of course but but if there's something that that plays a, a vital role then definitely i would i would write write a test case for that uh, but this is a question that everyone struggles with right uh, I struggle with it every day. Uh, every developer uh, goes with it. Sometimes you just have to basically uh, compromise and say, perhaps I don't really see the value of this test, but since I did test a similar functionality in, in another part of the program, then just for consistency uh, reasons, I, would, I, will, I will make sure to write something like that as well. Sometimes I skip uh, s some parts of tests and some forms of tests actually uh, just to make progress right it's a little bit like for me it's different i always make a difference between core functionality of a, of an application and secondary functionality right the, the the cosmetics as i sometimes refer to that like everything that is core that that let's say if it's airbnb for instance right where the core functionality there is to have a guy or girl that has a, a flat and another person that is supposed to travel to the, a specific city to be able to rent that flat that is the core functionality right all the other uh nonsense about you know uh you know what it looks like or 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 suggestions on the side when if you if you are in london that week you can go on a sightseeing tour these are secondary f functions in my opinion right so i would probably be very selective in what sort of of uh, of tests i will be writing and what is in focus at any given time but i'm not saying that 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 is a right strategy it depends of course on the project but it is an important thing it's a good question uh, and you you will have to basically play it by ear a little bit uh, and 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 make decisions on if it's valuable or not 
on any given time. Yeah. Does that okay. answer your question? It, it does. Does I'm thinking about cases, for instance, when you're handling with the list or something, mm -hmm. and do you want to test when it has one item, when it has two items, when it has three, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, that's a very pr pr practical example. So let's say I'm I'm supposed to to uh, output a, a a UL an unnumbered list with some LIs list items in it. Uh, given I get a response from an API, uh, let's say that I predict that I will get 10 responses. So I would say, let's take a look at this UL and it should have 10 children, for instance, right? So 10 list items. Uh, I would probably not go in into every list item and say, and ask, you know, or validate what sort of content the, each list item uh, contains, for instance, right? Uh, but That'll again, it depends. For another test. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, we'll be covering a little bit of that, of course, later today, but also uh, further down the line in this in this course. Uh, let me move on. Uh, so, again, never lose sight of why we are testing code, especially when you are deep into that as a beginner. Uh, remember the story I told you about this kid that learns how to walk and falls down and, and hurts himself or herself a few times. A few times the kid never says, you know, fuck this shit, this walking business is not for me. So when you, if you want to become a good uh, developer and if you choose to include testing into in your tool belt, uh, then you will struggle. You will have to overcome a lot of, uh, a lot of obstacles and just stick to it. Generally, uh, test, well-tested software is better software. Uh, and so, again, general principles that can be, be applied to all type of testing strategies, whether they, they are manual or, uh, or automated. You want to find bugs and you want to expose poorly written code. We call it code smells, smelly code. And then look for corner cases, special use cases of your software, what happens if somebody doesn't input the right type of data and so on. And you can expose these kind of things in manual testing, again, time consuming and costly, or in automated tests, which is faster, less expensive, but takes more work because you have to write those, those scripts one way or another. Uh, other things, if, if you think about test-driven development, that kind of test brings more to the table. It helps you with making in making design uh, decisions. It stimulates critical thinking. I sometimes say that it actually stimulates thinking uh, overall because, some, you know, if I don't test, I just hammer away and, and, and really develop some nonsense features. Uh, but if I have to test everything first and, and do, do take a, a test-driven approach, it stimulates me, stimulates me in my thinking and decision-making and prioritizing. But it also increases my confidence in terms of improving and refactoring code uh, because I you know, once I have those automated tests, I just keep on running them. And even if I change something in my implementation, I can still see that it, it actually uh, does what it's supposed to do. It helps me adding new features. So it still works as Anya uh, pointed out because it does not only about working, but working even when, when you add, add more stuff. Uh, sometimes you need to upgrade uh, your dependencies and all of that things. And you know, if you don't have automated tests, and you do an up uh, uh, an upgrade of 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 uh, libraries, you don't know if it's going to work or not uh, until until it hits production, right? And when you deploy a code or continue, you know, and and push out things to live servers again, all software will be will be tested either by you and your team or by your users, and you don't want you want to avoid that one way or another. Okay, so well, I talk often about specs and you've probably heard this. What is a spec? A spec is a specification. And this is a little bit of terminology, which is basically an executable example that tests whether a portion of code exhibit the expected behavior in a controlled context. That's a fancy, uh, fancy description. Uh, if we try to simplify that a little bit, uh, I usually use this, and I have this as a um, as a post-it note on my workstation. Given 
something is present. The, given there is a context, when something occurs, then I expect something to happen, right? Given when then, given I have some, I have access to some data, and when I do something with that data, then I want uh, the specific ex uh, result to be present, and never lose sight of that. Given when then. Uh, it's very easy to, to, to think that this is logical, but when you actually write your tests, you will probably forget at least one of these steps, uh, in the beginning at least. Given there is some data or some context, when something occurs, then I expect to find a specific out outcome. And then just for the sake of it, I have a picture of a kitten, uh, because I've heard somewhere that it's a good strategy to keep people awake. Uh, I found this one, you know, when you when you when you debug and you find some bugs, uh, if you just patch things around, you end up with more more bugs. I don't know if it's really even relevant to this presentation, but it's a fucking kitten, so now I had it. Uh, right, let's move on. So the four phases of every test uh, that you need to to uh, think about um, is a setup create all the objects that your tests, test database or your test uh, will have, will rely upon. Uh, make the call to, uh, you know, interacting with the data, for instance, an API endpoint or what have you. Assert, make sure that the response contains the data you're looking for one way or another. And then the fourth one uh, is usually um, referred to as cleanup or teardown. Uh, you have to reset the, the everything. The, your software needs to be resetted because every test needs to be run from a clean state of your application, usually, so you can predict what the outcome will be. Like if you are testing for, let's say, creating an object in your database, you have to be sure that your database is empty uh, or that specific table is empty in the beginning of the test. Then you create the object then you assert that there is uh, at least one entry in your database and then you move on. Next test requires a clean database again, for instance, or reset of the, of the entire application. So that is also uh, really important. And if we talk about any other context, like smart contracts, Ether Ethereum, for instance, if you deploy something to the chain locally, you need to know that that uh, you can predict the outcome. You don't want to clutter uh, the, the, the chain with any other objects, for instance, before uh, for the next test. Other way to put this, this is stolen from, from an instructor, a book about testing. They called, they had this abbreviation of AAA, arrange, act and assert, uh, which is basically the same thing that I'm saying on this slide, but in, the, in other words set up the test input and object under test environment, call the function you want to test, and then assert that that the outcome is what you desire it to be. And if we talk about web-based applications, uh, because up until now, everything is simple, right? You just, you know, you create a function, uh, you call on it, and, and you, you verify some data. Uh, or some output, but in in principle, when you when we work with web-based applications, there are things happening on so many levels in in our apps. Uh, so we want to we want to write a high level. Uh, the, if we look at this outside-in approach that that call asked about a, a while ago, we write a high-level outside business value example. For that, we can use Cypress. I'm going to talk about tools in just a second, and that. It, that test is supposed to fail because remember we haven't written a single code line of implementation code yet. We want to write a lower level inside example using, for instance, Jest, Mocha, Chai, or whatever, for the first step of the implementation that goes red, and then we start to write implementation code. Uh, we write the minimum amount of code to pass the lower level example, see it go green, and then. Um, uh, write even more lower level examples just to push it towards passing step number one and then make sure that from time to time you run the high level test and, and, and when it goes green you basically move on to the next step. And this is, you know, this one way of looking at it. Uh, 
you have to experience this in order to to understand it uh, totally uh we will do a few examples actually we will we will we will and i just wanted to show you um because i don't think i have it here or do i have it here no i don't and it was unfortunate hold on a second uh i need to just grab um there it is no shit please don't hold on a second oh, guys yeah the cucumber the cucumber song i can play it while i look for some other um some other examples um oh yes yes uh, uh let's talk about cucumber first before we we uh, we play that one so cucumber is is a very interesting testing framework uh, but before we get into that i really need my computer to stop acting up damn it so there we go right so i need to go in here add a new slide and then change the layout of the slide to this one and apparently that doesn't fly right right here is the uh, the idea of the outside in approach let's see if we can make that happen for you uh, this is a schem schematic some of you uh, that has followed me around in my streams have seen this so this is an example of the outside in uh, outside in approach where we talk about and here i introduce two two other uh, terms uh, one called acceptance test and another one called unit test so the acceptance test is the high level testing that springs out of the user interface the very interaction layer between the user and the and the application and the unit test is the uh, underlying functionality that actually makes things happen uh, and you write a test in the acceptance test layer first uh, and then you uh, go down or dive deeper into the unit test uh, level and and kind of interact or jump between those two layers back and forward during your process and the red and green parts are the most important ones the dotted green one is the refactoring stage where no new tests are are written but rather uh, the code is improved upon uh, in terms of you know modular uh, aspects readability performance and so on uh, so this is a this is a I didn't come up with this myself. I stole it from somewhere, uh, but it's it's a good uh, uh, it's a good schema. It's a good illustration of how how this work kind of this outside in approach actually actually work. Uh, we will be referring to this this uh, illustration a few times moving forward. Um, right. So if we look at tools, there are plenty of tools, and I just really uh, I really just mention just a, a few of them if we look at ruby in ruby i personally usually test using a, a tool called rspec it stands for ruby specification uh, cucumber is a is a uh, very very exciting testing framework for acceptance tests uh, it brings a lot to the table in terms of um, how you can interact or how you can use tests not only to make sure that your uh, application does what it's supposed to do and not only to improve your design decisions but also how you can collaborate with your non-technical stakeholders because cucumber uses a very very simple syntax that is basically plain english uh, and is actually translated to quite a few um, quite a few uh, other languages so you can use it in German Portuguese or whatever right uh, so you can show your external stakeholders your clients 
the testing suit without them having to understand anything about technology. So Cucumber divides or splits your tests into two layers. One where you give the, the test uh, the testing framework high level instructions and then another layer where you actually to tell uh, tell cucumber how to execute those instructions so we separate that and the higher level is is very readable and it's a fantastic uh, fantastic experience i've used cucumber extensively in my career i can show you a few examples of uh, of cucumber uh, we will however not cover cucumber in this in this uh, uh, in these training sessions, uh, because it's uh, it's quite well, it's not that complicated, but it's a little bit out of fashion uh, today, right? There are better tools uh, that can uh, uh, can be used to achieve the same results, and Cypress is is the one that is the most exciting uh, and the most the strongest one of them. So when Cypress came around, I I uh, left Cucumber myself. Um, yeah, so Minitest is another testing framework for Ruby. Not very interesting. We, we won't be covering that. In JavaScript, uh, I would say Mocha Chai is is the equivalent of what RSpec does for Ruby. That is what what uh, uh, what works best in JavaScript. Uh, Jasmine and Karma are a little bit things of the past. They are test runners uh, that are also. They have been surpassed by Cypress big time. Uh, so Cypress is, is again uh, winning that battle. Jest is extremely powerful and allows you to test all sorts of, of JavaScript based uh, functionality uh, in many, many aspects. Not, I, I, I never use Jest for vanilla JavaScript um, uh, projects, but you can do it if you want. You can use Jest for, to test basically everything. Uh, but if we move on to React, I would say that Jest together together with React testing library is the best way to, to go about it. Enzyme is an assertion library from Airbnb, I think they wrote it. It's, it was great, but React testing library is better nowadays. Uh, that's for, for, for unit testing, uh, or rather component testing in, in React. Uh, but Cypress IO uh, definitely for for acceptance tests or, or usability tests right uh, again just uh, just a few few examples of the tools that are out there and why do I throw this at you well because if you want to include testing into your tool belt and I sh again I strongly feel that you should uh, you have to understand that it takes uh, a lot of learning and there are many many tools that you need to to know a little bit about and certain some of them you need to dive deeper into um, and that could be a bit overwhelming uh, but it's worth it trust me it's definitely worth it right right it is well, it didn't take as long as I thought. It was, I thought it would be take a bit longer. Any questions about about the testing part so far before we jump into into actually writing a few tests? You're blown away. I totally understand that. Well, I think your microphone is a little bit weird. You sound like a like. I mean, like a, like a chipmunk. Yeah. <laughs> no, man, that's, no, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Carl. It's that doesn't awesome. work. It's like it takes your 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 sound and compresses it and and plays it up much faster. You like you sound like uh, I don't know what. Chima said it best. <laughs> sorry, man. Sorry, I can't even play it back uh, slower. You're gonna have to write <laughs> write what you mean, my brother. I sorry, I'm sorry. It's not gonna work. Ethan, do you have any questions about the testing part or the theory part that I just covered? Um, well, so so Cypress IO you can use for with React as well. Correct? Absolutely, yes, sir. You can use that for any any uh, any any application that that displays anything in a browser. Um, 
Uh, you can probably hear yourself later on, Carl, on the on the recording. That was awesome. It was pretty pretty awesome. And yeah, from, from what I from what I when I've talked to people, it's like Cypress I O is way better than anything else that's out there. Uh, I would I would say say that without being endorsed by by Cyprus full disclosure I'm not getting paid by this but I would say that this is the best thing since uh, you know uh, American pancakes with with uh, maple syrup yeah, yeah. Uh, definitely so Cyprus I always is great I love it uh, except it, with MetaMask. <laughs> well, but we did make it make it work uh, when, it works. when yeah, it works. when it works, it works it's right. awesome. <laughs> so, so, so there is a there is another another library that I didn't mention here that could be that is very relevant uh, in testing web-based applications, and that is a, a headless Chrome browser that is. Uh, uh, that is p bundled into a, a, a library called Puppeteer. So Puppeteer allows us to interact with the browser fully pro programmatically without having to look at it, you know, like spinning it up in a window. Or, but you can do it if you if you want to do it. Puppeteer is extremely powerful. Uh, it can it c you can control every aspect of what's going on in the browser uh, in terms of. Uh, what you see, how JavaScript is being uh, compiled, network, how networking works, and so on. And so, uh, what 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 I did at some point uh, a few months ago or a month ago is to extend Cypress with some functionality to, to be able to interact with browser extensions, which is not possible to do in Cypress as it as it stands today. And I did that using Puppeteer. Uh, so I'm having those two interact with each other, and that uh, cost me a few gray hairs on my scalp, but uh, it was quite rewarding. I got a few emails from from developers that work on on uh, on blockchain and DApps and distributed applications, and are using that that uh, that extension uh, to Cypress. Um, so I'm proud of myself. That's so cool! Congratulations. <laughs> but but Anya is it was my first pre-beta tester. I think you were the one that yeah. used this for the first time, and I <laughs> guess that there are some gray hairs on your scalp as well. After oh that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, software development, especially in the Windows sub Linux uh, system. Oh, uh, oh yeah, that, environment. Co that cost you like two or three days of of, <laughs> of hard labor, I guess. Uh, right. Yes. Right. <laughs> All right, folks, uh, we're going to do uh, a programming exercise. We're going to do the dreaded FizzBuzz Kata. And the FizzBuzz Kata or FizzBuzz test is an interview question that is designed to filter out 99.5% of all schmucks uh, that apply for a job because um, they they can't code their way out of the wet paper bag, as I say here. I don't know if that's relevant or not. No, but but so I, I think of, of all the all the tests that you can be submitted to, at least a, a few years back, the FizzBuzz was the most common one. They would ask you to 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 solve that that problem. The problem is very easy, <clears throat> and the uh, uh, I probably will turn off the copilot for this one. Right, uh, it comes from a children's game called FizzBuzz. Uh, that is used in, in 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 some some schools to teach kids about the vision, and I think I I kind of explained that at some point. Uh, you take numbers, and if a number is div divisible by three, you don't say the number, but you rather say the word fizz. And then if a number is divisible by five, you don't say that number either. You say buzz, and to make things a little complicated. When a number is divisible by 15, you say FizzBuzz, okay? So the example here would be, again, 1, 2, Fizz, 4, Buzz, Fizz, and then 7, 8, Fizz, Buzz, 11, Fizz, 13, 14, and then Fizz, Buzz, 16, 17, Fizz, and so on, right? Is that the type of mathematics that they teach in Sweden, or...? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I guess I I I was in Poland uh, until the fifth grade, so uh, I missed that that one. 
but I, I I think we use that in Sweden at some point. Yeah, uh, just it's it's a it's a way that you know because you play it by you know you sit in a ring and you're supposed to say you know those uh, repeat those numbers and increment and it's it it should stimulate um, you know fast thinking and fast division and so on right. It, there is a small, small algorithm that needs to be written in this one, uh, so uh, so the, which makes it interesting from from a tech as a technical challenge, and it's trivial, it's seemingly simple, and you can again ask candidates when they are applying for a job to do that kata, and if they fail, they probably don't know programming that well, uh, or. Perhaps they do, but they don't. Uh, you can observe their workflow and how they approach this, and and uh, you can. It's quite telling about the candidate how they solve this this uh, this program this this problem. And there is a website dedicated to Fizzbuzz. Uh, I'm not going to search for it. I guess you guys are better at googling than me. But but there are, there I know that there is a website where they list over 200 or 300 solutions to the Fizzbuzz Kata in all various uh, programming languages uh, from, you know, machine code to, to Lisp or what have you, right? And, and so on. Um, it, it, it is a very common, common Kata. So my idea is that we will do this in both Ruby programming language and then we will use, the, use JavaScript, uh, Node.js, uh, for this, right? So JavaScript that we execute in in our uh, um, in our terminal. I see two calls, so I guess you joined with another computer just to fix your audio issue. Is that so? Correct. Oh, now there's redundancy. Okay, cool. Sorry about the. Yeah, I forgot to mute the. No, our... no problems. Uh, but guys, if you. Uh, engage in some small talk or whatever. I need five minutes to visit uh, the facilities and stretch my legs. And after that, fire up your engines, start your terminals, uh, and um, and we will get busy coding. Is that okay with you guys? Yeah, it's fine. Sounds great. All right, I'll be right back. And you guys do the small talking. Cheers. Okay, don't be scared. I switched off the speakers on the other computer. Okay, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to brace yourself. <laughs> you lost your chipmunk voice. Yeah, that's actually, it's a shame. It was really fun. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing myself later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so this is interesting. Uh, I think we're going to, yeah do the tests first and then do the implementation for FizzBuzz? I have no idea. Um, I don't, I've never seen this before. I've done it in the past, like just the FizzBuzz, not writing the tests first. Never even heard of this before. Uh, but have you heard of 99 bottles? Chima? Yeah. You've heard about the 99 bottles one, though? No, I haven't. Uh, I'm, that's also I'm, a I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of the guy who Thomas was just talking about, you know. I, I really, 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 um, I didn't really like testing. I was just to try and find a way to get around it. So, um, unfortunately, I, well, I have to, I have to get used to it. So, well, this buzz and that it's not like typically cool just for testing it was just a typical like interview question from what I've read. And it's they also popular for doing TDD, I guess, because they simple, so you can write the test easily first. And then, I mean, you've done some Rails development, right? Yeah, quite a bit. Because I thought you might have heard of it because Sandy Metz uh, wrote a book. She wrote a book on, uh, what's it, Poodle? Uh, 
one of the something of, uh, she wrote a book on object oriented programming anyway and she wrote another book called 99 bottles which i haven't done yet uh, i see but uh challenges are all there. I mean, 99 bottles is the song which i guess the rest of us know but 99 bottles beer on the wall 99 bottles of beer take one down pass it around 98 bottles of beer on the wall and you just make a program that kind of prints those lines go correctly Oh, okay. F Actually, now it sounds familiar. I'm also looking forward to learning more about testing. I haven't, I've only like dipped my toes, so to speak. I've, I've, uh, I've actually, I've actually done a little bit of ac acceptance testing on some of the stuff that I've worked on, but I just end up, you know, stopping and then just going on with the code. And you, Anya? I've dipped and burned my toes, yeah. <laughs> That's what I would say. <laughs> I, guess the, I guess the first time that I was trying to really do some, some proper testing was uh, when I was trying to do this um, very, very simple kind of uh, smart contract um, direct with a browser extension uh, wallet actually for for a blockchain and uh, that that's that's when I started trying to test and I was <laughs> and the, the setup only for the testing was already like uh, horrible it was horrible to get it to work just the setup not even talking about tests so yeah I did a boot camp where we had tests for most challenges, but we didn't write the tests ourselves. I didn't know, like, I, I imagine tests always be like, all just tests. They even created some cool text. Like, we had this one challenge on, uh, <laughs> yes, well, it had to do with hamburgers. And when you run the test, they actually did some, like, terminal art with hamburgers and stuff. It was quite cool. So, how's the small talk going for you guys? We said we hated tests. Okay, I'm gonna ki kill the stream now. Bye bye. <laughs> All right, uh, folks, folks, you can't hate something that uh, you don't. That that helps you so much. Anyway, let's let's do some coding, folks. Come on, don't hate. Uh, I'm. I, I love. I love tests. You do well. There we go. There we yeah. go. You got. You just you got. Go. You just got yourself a gold star, uh, in my book. Let's create a folder, okay? And let's call this folder fizz underscore buzz. Fizz buzz and cd into that folder, and then create another folder. <clears throat> right. Let's create. Um, right. Let's create a folder. Uh, that is called specs or spec. Let's call it spec, right? And then create another folder that is called source, S R C, right? And then we want to create a file, and this file needs to be called gem file with a capital G. Okay, and that's it. Just gem file. And then we want to do yawn init dash y. And we are going to mix Ruby and JavaScript into one single uh, folder. So I'm not going to follow all the conventions that are, are out there because we will hold both both Ruby and JavaScript uh, contained in the same project. So we're going to we're going to cheat a little bit. But basically what I'm doing here is I'm creating one folder that will hold our tests and another folder that will hold our implementation code, right? Tests or tests, code or code, right? And then I'm creating something called gem file. The gem file is a file that will uh, 
hold information about the dependencies that we will be using or the libraries that we will be using for our Ruby code. And when I do yarn init, that kind of creates um, um, a package JSON file, which is holding information about our dependencies that we will be using for JavaScript and then some, right? So the package JSON and the gem file are pretty much the same thing. Anyways, let's do this. Let's open this up in our code editor. And if you guys want to tag along fully on this, you probably want to, yeah, fuck off. I just wrote this. I trust myself. Uh, you probably want to install um, uh, an extension for Ruby that is perhaps VS Code Ruby syntax highlighting for for the Ruby programming language. I have some more extensions, but you don't have to have that. The Solar Graph is a is a code formatter for Ruby, but you guys are so great, so you format your code. Uh, manually right you don't make mistakes so it's not like me i'm sloppy you guys will will pay attention to every detail if you want to install that solar graph is is the way to do it but vs code ruby is enough and ruby perhaps i don't know uh right so here in the gem file we want to say gem and then quotes and then say R spec. Okay, gem R spec. And then we head over to our terminal again. And then we say something like bundle install. Install. And if you get an error when you do bundle install, then that's probably because you don't have a gem in, so Ruby should be predefined on your computers. It usually is, at least on Linux and Mac. Uh, that should be should be pre-installed. Uh, and if you don't have, if you can't execute this command, then you just need to run this command: gem install install bundler bundler like this bundler gem install bundler, and that will will uh, install that necessary. Uh, necessary dependency when we run bundle install that installs the rspec testing library for us with its core dependencies and we can see them because we have a new file now that is called gem file lock and if i open that file up we never have to modify this this file but sometimes we just want to open it to see its content we can see that we have R spec with a lot of sub dependencies, you know, whatever R spec is, is dependent on. And that, that is what happens, right? Uh, so now we have that. We will um, we will just type clear here so we get more space. And now we will focus a little bit on the JavaScript path, right? So we, we did run yarn in it. Uh, so we initialize that. So now I want to say yarn add and then capital D. It's not really necessary in this project, but just so we, we keep things, uh, you know, in the right place. We just want to save these, these uh, libraries as development dependencies. So I'm going to say yarn add D mocha and chai. No commas, nothing. You just separate that by by a space. You hit enter, and you are installing the dependencies. And very similarly to what you have in with Ruby, when you have your gem file and gem file lock, you have now your package JSON and then yarn dot lock. We can just take a small peek into that file, and we can see that just by installing Mocha and Chai we actually install shitloads of dependencies, right? A huge amount of libraries. Don't have to worry about that much. Let's just close this and pretend we never saw this. But we do have another 
uh, another folder in our project that is called node modules right and that folder includes all of those all of those dependencies now what i want to do now at this stage because for your sake and for my own sake i want to uh, place this under version control so i'm going to head over to my uh, to my terminal and i'm going to just issue this command git init so git init initializes an empty uh, git repository and we can see that we have a lot of untracked files because git automatically tracks every file in my project folder now i don't want it to track node modules don't worry about ruby because ruby deals with this slightly differently so we want uh, we want we probably won't have to deal with that but for javascript we need to tell version control to ignore the node modules subfolder so for that we're going to create a new file uh, and that file will be called git ignore but it needs to be a hidden file and hidden files are characterized by the fact that they start with a dot so you say dot git ignore and there are no typos here people it needs to be called git ignore nothing else no capital letters nothing like that and now in your vs code you have to go into the git ignore file and you have to say node underscore score modules node modules like this this will tell git to ignore the uh, uh, the no node modules sub subfolder and now if i just hit enter once i don't have se whatever 7000 files or whatever what i add i only have five files that are on track and i can do check that by saying git status in my terminal and i can see that the files that i have added is the git ignore gem file gem file log package json and yarn log right please also note and i'm you know i'm just teaching you a little bit of peripheral knowledge that we did create the spec folder and the source folder right they are not recognized by git yet because they are empty git doesn't track empty folders you can't do it so in order for to have git track them we actually need to go into this folder create a new file that we call dot we call it git keep uh, or just dot keep this is a workaround to uh, to actually uh, have git uh, track this this folder because it's no longer empty it does contain something it's a nonsense uh, or just keep yeah um, uh, it's a nonsense file but it's it's a file so it's not empty so now if i go over to my terminal and do git status again i can see that git is actually tracking not only the files that i created but it also uh, tracks uh, the spec and the source folder does this make sense to you people it does small nods right sure good stuff so now i want to add everything to version control do git status again as i refer to this as a sanity check now they are no longer red they are green which means that that git is actually tracking this one and here i just want to say git commit uh, and pass in two flags a and m i, I always pass them in uh, a stands for amended files and m stands for uh, that i want to add a message add double quotes and say adds or creates creates uh, basic you know uh, project structure structure like this and now i have committed this and if i do git status now git will tell me that there are nothing to to commit nothing to track apart from the thing that i just added to to version control today is not about version control i'm just i'm just uh, mentioning these basic commands right now because the 
next talk that we'll we will ha be having after the weekend on next next Tuesday I will be covering more uh, about version control and why that is really important to track so I just wanted to give you a bit of a little bit of taste uh, of of what will come later on but today is about testing so let's do that let's let's uh, let's test a little bit uh, we did cr um, we did add RSpec and installed it, and we did add Mocha and Chai and install that. So we have the, the necessary dependencies. Uh, what I need to do now is to tell RSpec that I want to initialize it in my, in my, uh, uh, in my project. So for that, I will execute the following command. And I really haven't done this in a long time, so I hope I'm doing it right. I'm going to say rspec dash dash init and pray for the best. Yes, it worked. Uh, so what happens now is that rspec creates uh, two files, one hidden file that is called dot rspec, and then in the spec folder, RSpec created a file that is called specHelper.rb. So let's take a look at both of them. Uh, here in the .rspec, it has just one setting. It says dash dash requires specHelper. It's a configuration for all our tests to always include this this helper function. Here we want to say we want to make an addition. And we're going to say dash dash format documentation. Um, and this has to do with, um, with the output of, uh, of our test. Uh, so it also, uh, so RSpec is being installed by adding gem RSpec to, to the gem file and then running bundle install in your, in your term terminal. And then, as the last step, you just say rspec dash dash init. Uh, so, a little bit of sanity check. If this works, I should be able to just run rspec in my terminal. Hit enter, and it should, should say zero examples and zero failures. And this means that the configuration actually worked. I have no errors, uh, um, so far at least. Um, for those of you who code along, you should run that that command to see if if uh, uh, if this actually worked for you. All right, so let's focus a little bit on Mocha, and feel free to stop me if I'm going too fast, or if you want to take notes, or 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 if you're not keeping up, that's perfectly fine. But and if you keep quiet, I will just carry on. So let's focus a little bit on Mocha and Chai. So. We added Mocha and Chai as a dependency, and so I will just run Mocha uh, to see if it works. And the way I run it, or can try run to run it, is to just say Mocha in my terminal, and it says that Mocha command not found. Okay, so I can make it hard for me and run it directly from the node modules folder, or I can do an, a better solution, and that is to go into my package JSON. And after the dev dependencies section, that is here, I can just add a comma and add um, scripts. Well, actually, it gave me that right. I can add scripts, and that would be um, um, uh, that would be an object. And in there, I would just say test, and then mock it so as a key value. Okay. Uh, and I think my companion, our co-pilot is kicking in on this one because I'm getting some code for free, which is always nice. Uh, so now, if I have this, this setting, I should be able to... Let me just see so I'm not covering anything in stream. Oh, I'm okay. Uh, where are you? There you are. Right. Uh, so now I should be able to say yawn test. Right. Okay. And now he outputs an error. He says that no, uh, no, fi no tests were found in a folder named test. 
okay? And why is that? Well, that is because the default behavior of Mocha as a library is to look into a folder that is called test. We don't have that folder. Our tests will be in a folder called spec because I uh, feel like it. So I will just tell uh, Mocha in my package JSON, in my script, I will just say spec uh, to point Mocha to that particular uh, to that particular folder, and that should fix our problem. And if I run yawn test again, it changes the error message and it says no test files found, right? Because we don't have any tests. Uh, at least we are looking in the right in the right folder at this point. Does that make sense? Good stuff. Yeah. Okay, so now we know that we have a way to run our mocha tests and we do have a way to run our RSpec tests. You see that the behavior is slightly different, but it's a little bit of this same same uh but but uh uh, but but different kind of thing. Jim, thank you very much. Just a, just a quick note to Jim from Canada that is following us on Twitch. Uh, I I was having a talk about legacy code at some point, and you know I had this fancy uh, quote as I usually have in my pr presentation decks about what what uh, uh, legacy code is all about. And Jim actually coined. Uh, an expression that I'm using in my presentations now. He said, legacy code is the reason I have a job. Uh, so uh, as a programmer, uh, he's, he's working with a lot of legacy, legacy projects that are really shitty code and it, it pays his bills and I love it. Uh, so I include that uh, nowadays in my presentation. Legacy code is the reason why I have a job. So Jim, you made it into my, into my world with a bang, brother. Thank you very much for that. Uh, right. <laughs> well, if it's an honor to you, it's definitely an honor to me, my friend. Uh, so now we know we can run RSpec and we know that that we can run um, um, Mocha. So let's let's start to fix our uh, FizzBuzz uh, problem. So in our spec spec uh, uh, folder, we're going to create two files. We're going to create one file that we will call fizz and we're going to follow the ruby convention to use snake case so it's going to be fizz underscore buzz underscore spec dot rb like this and then we're going to create another file that will follow no that's not where are you there you are we're going to follow more of a javascript convention and so I'm going to call this fizz buzz in camel case. And then I'm going to say dot spec dot js. And I misspelled fizz. How the fuck can I, sorry, how can I misspell fizz? That's incredible. I wasn't looking. There we go, fizz. Um, come on. Right. Why, what's happening now? Why can't I reman, rename uh, a file? Okay, so did my computer just hang before because I renamed a file? Are you kidding me? No, it works now. Okay, good stuff. All right, so we have two test files created. One that is a JavaScript file and another one that is, um, uh, that is a, um, uh, a Ruby file, right? Okay, so let's start with the JavaScript file because it calls for a little bit of configuration. So in our JavaScript file, we actually need to tell our test runner to include some files. Uh, so we will do something like this. We're going to say const um, we're going to say const um, what do I need to include here right we're going to 
right exactly so we're going to say const and then oh, well, come on give me a break const hard brackets and i will say expect uh, equals require chai get lost um quick thing can you make it just a little bit bigger I... I will try i will try If I just can find my cursor, here it is. Uh, something like this? Oh, that's perhaps. Yeah. Oh, oh that's too much. Perfect. Yeah. Something like this. Okay. Yeah. Right. So. Uh, right, and then. Um, and then I'm gonna require, like I'm gonna say const. Uh, I'm not going to use the companion actually. Const fizz buzz. Uh, well, actually, it's going to be fizz buzz equals require. And then I'm going to do dot dot slash src slash and then fizz buzz dot js i probably don't have to say js but let's let's say uh, js anyway okay so we don't have this file this file doesn't exist yet do you understand but it doesn't matter because we are writing tests before we actually have implementation code so don't don't i wouldn't worry about this actually uh, and then we're going to say we're going to use a uh, um uh, a keyword called describe and you've seen me do it before and I have a snippet that uh, that gives me a describe block and uh, and we can describe the fizz buzz game right so we can say fizz buzz uh, game and we can stick to that for now and then I'm gonna say let I'm going to define uh, a variable and I'm going to call the variable game actually and then add a before block uh, right before block like this and in the before block I'm going to say game equals new fizz buzz uh, so I'm going to instantiate uh, an object that will be uh, stored in game like this uh, right and why is this giving me uh, an error oh because right sorry because it's like this before this this is what i need to do right sorry i have a f damn fly in my room i hate flies and it sits on me. Is that because I'm sweaty today? Because it's 30 plus degrees or something? I don't know. Right, so I need to instantiate a new uh, new thing. What do I need to add, Pedro? Uh, it's not you probably already have it. I was saying everyone that doesn't have the sources for the gems installed, they need to add source um, rubygems.org to the beginning of their of the gem file. Uh, gem did, file. did anybody yeah. get that problem? Did I miss something? Uh, you, you I also had to do that. Yeah, I had to do that as well. Oh, really? So Everyone yeah, except for Thomas. Everyone except So you needed to do source like this and then what? HTTPS. HTTPS. Uh, Ruby, Ruby RubyGems.org. Dot dot org. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. I, I, uh, I thought that every that you didn't have to add this, uh, but apparently you did. Uh, good catch. Thank you, guys, for, for, for setting me straight on this one. Uh, right, let's go back to the JS. Right, so now we have this, uh, this before block and we are instantiating an object uh, that, again, we don't have code for and so on, right? So we're going to say it, again, I should probably kill, kill the... Uh, uh, kill the companion. How do I turn companion off? Can I do that? Uh, let's see. Um, 
Copilot, I mean. Copilot. I need to ch I need to turn it off. Uh, disable. Right, I need to disable it for this one. Reload required. Sorry, because it gives me too much too much answers, and I don't want that at this <laughs> point. I actually want to code this and not. It would be so fast if I if I use Copilot. Uh, right. Let's see. Let's wait for it to reload. Uh, right. So uh, we will just say it. So so the game is is a numbers game, right? So we pass in a number to the game, and we expect it to get give us something back. And what should it give us back if I pass in number one? Anyone? You know the rules of FizzBuzz, right? So if I pass in one, what should the program give me? One. 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 Okay. So let's let's write that. It. Uh, and it the it blocks takes two arguments, right? First a message and then a callback. Uh, so it does this. So we would say is expected to return return one if given one. It's simple. So we could say something like this: expect game game uh, and we're gonna create a method saying play for instance or check let's say play and then we will pass in one to it two equal equal one that is the first test we're gonna we're gonna write if we pass in one to the play method of this fizzbuzz game then we will get one back Okay, let's run it and see what's up. Remember, we haven't written a single line of code. We can assume that this test will fail for us, right? It would be extremely weird if it actually passed, wouldn't it? I mean, we haven't written any code yet, so. So we're just gonna issue this, co this command, yawn test, and it should fail. It did heavily it failed with a bang with a lot of output and for beginners it is always uh, uh, a scary scary moment wow shit I get so much output here but the uh, the key is in looking at the first few lines of the of the error output that you will you'll see it says right on top saying that it cannot find module fizzbuzz js it simply doesn't exist right so we go to the source folder and we create a file that we will call fizzbuzz js fizzbuzz.js and in this file we can create a constant that we call fizzbuzz and that will be an object and then we just say module exports equals fizzbuzz so I have a hopefully quick question yeah go ahead after we added the dependencies in the node uh, package file did we need to run something the dependencies the right so if you uh, you add those dependencies by saying yarn add dash d mocha and chai that's and then th that will install them for you and then you have to manually add this this part that says scripts as an object and then uh, a key value saying test just, mocha spec i just saw something the most common problem which is that i had a typo ah but go. okay, and after I do all that, I should just be able to run Mocha or Yarn test, and it should run. Uh, if you add this script, then you say Yarn test. Yeah, that should this should work then. Yeah. Okay. Move the mouse away. Mm -hmm. All right. So it's I'll look into it because it looks everything like it's correct, but. And is the the name of the file correct? That you have. Uh, 
you know uh, correct correct name that uh, the, a you have to have the fizzbus spec js in the spec folder and then you have to have in the source folder another called fizzbus okay i haven't created that fizzbus file yet all right uh try Thanks. that and we'll see what's up anyway i will rerun my test again now uh and it will give me another error right and an error that is more manageable and it says fizzbuzz is not a constructor because it's not a constructor then we need to to uh, change that um uh change that in uh in my fizzbuzz js so we instead of saying const we're gonna say class instead uh and no equal sign so we're just going to say class fizzbuzz and uh and curly brackets and at this stage i'm just gonna you know say that there are so many different ways to do this i'm gonna do this as a class object because that will resemble the uh the ruby impl ruby implementation a lot so we we can do we can run it like this and so if i run this again we should get uh another error saying that gameplay is not a function. Do you understand? That's really, really simple. So let's, uh, uh, let's fix that function uh, for us. Um, because we for, yeah, we want to uh, go into this. So we will say this, we will say constructor, constructor, no, we're actually not going to use a constructor. Sorry, we can just say the. Um, bu 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 bu. We can say yeah, game. Can we say that game? And then number. And then we're just going to say this, and we want to say return number. Number. I believe it's play. Oh, you play. Sorry, play, play, play. Thank you. Right. So we say play. We allow this play function to uh, to take one argument and the argument will be number and at this stage the only thing we want to say is to return this number and nothing else we will of course change that in in uh, in a short while but for now we only want to run this test again and the test goes green now because it is expected to return one if given one right and we are fulfilling the uh, uh this particular test requirement do you understand uh there's nothing else happening here uh so what if we abandon this for just a second and we're gonna go into um we're gonna go into um uh one question thomas right when did you create the spec helper it was created for us automatically when we run our spec dash dash in it spec in it got it right i forgot that stuff no problem so here uh if we if we focus just uh, just quickly on fizzbuzz spec the rb test file we can just create a describe block describe and we can say fizzbuzz without any quotes actually and here we say do and as soon as we add a do we also need to add an end and do end is the equivalent of curly brackets in a in a function in in javascript so it's a block something we refer to as a block right and here we want to say let let game as a symbol so we we add a colon in in the beginning and then two curlies and we want to say fizzbuzz dot new right uh so this would be our before block uh in in a way there is another way to do this and we would say before do and and then we want to create a global variable so it would be with an add sign game equals fizz buzz 
dot new. This, this, and this is basically the same thing, but uh, here we don't have to use the the at sign in the beginning of a, of a variable. So I'm actually going to comment this one out. We don't. We're not going to use this for to start with. We're going to use this before. And why? Well, because I want to keep the similarities between Mocha and RSpec. And since we are using a before block here, we might as well use that in, in RSpec as well. Just so you can see that these guys are not that very different uh, from, from each other. And now I'm just going to say it. Uh, I'm sorry, Thomas. Um, go ahead. One question, if you can. Um, is the let like part of uh, Ruby, regular Ruby, and the before part of the both. Ruby as well, or is it from the both are library? RSpec. Both are RSpec, RSpec things. OK. okay. Yeah. Uh, so now I'm going to add an it block, very similar to what I did in, in this example. Uh, the syntax is slightly different, but the keyword is exactly the same. Right? So I'm going to say, uh, that instead of does something, I'm going to say is expected to return one if given one. And here I will use the exact same syntax uh, with small modifications uh, in that I used in the in the JavaScript example. I will say expect at game dot play and then pass in one. And here I will say two and then space eq space one right so if you look at this it block and the one in the javascript file they are pretty much the same there are just very tiny small differences uh, but uh, they are almost the same thing the only thing i need to do here is to say require uh, and it's easier for me to to use this require underscore relative and then uh, let's see so I don't make a fool of myself it's this 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 s or no dot dot it's dot dot actually dot dot s or c uh, fizz buzz and I don't think I need to say dot rb actually uh, on this one so you say require relative you point to the FizzBuzz implementation, and then we just say require describe FizzBuzz, this before block, and this it block. The it block is the actual test. Everything else is just uh, mm -hmm. setting up the stage for for it to happen, right? So again, uh, we have the almost the, sim the same syntax in both of them, and now if I run this. So, and I run this by just saying RSpec, and I could clarify for RSpec what to run. Uh, so we can say fizzbuzz, fizzbuzz RB. Uh, so we don't, um, we don't execute the whole thing, uh, the, the other JS file, but I don't think it will. So I think I can say just RSpec. Right, and and he is complaining very similar to what Mocha did. It's complaining that it can't find the fizzbuzz file in source folder, right? So we need to create that. So we go over to SRC, we create a new file, and we call it fizz underscore buzz dot rb. And here, I just say class fizzbuzz like this, and and then I define a function, and in Ruby we do that by saying def uh, play, and we allow this guy to take one argument, number, and end like this. And here I can say return number, or I can just say number. I don't. I can omit the return keyword. I don't have to to uh, to worry about it. And in Ruby you don't have to export anything. And if I run this test now, uh, it should go green for me. Do you understand? Because the only thing we're doing, we're passing in a number and we're returning this uh, as it stands. Um, and we have two versions. We have one 
Ruby version and one JavaScript version. Uh, and I hope that it makes sense so far. Uh, I know that Carl, you're coding along. Pedro, you are also coding along. Are you guys going green on these tests? Uh, I missed the JavaScript spec part. So don't have that right now. I'm going to try this one. Okay. Uh, I can keep this, this one uh, open if you want to tag along. Is there anybody else who is coding along? Uh, I'm, I'm a coder client, yeah. Good stuff. Uh, I want to read it uh, in on on stream. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Just keep keep track of the of the streamers. Keep track of the streamers. Right. So let's let's write um, a more uh, relevant test for this. So we could we could you know just copy this guy and and say that it is expected to return two if given two. And I'm going to switch back to the JavaScript implementation, right? So I would just pass in two and and return two. But it's not very interesting because it's the same same behavior. This, this test will go green automatically for me. Uh, so if I do yarn test, uh, both of them should should uh, should go green. That's not not very interesting. But the the uh, the more interesting test would be if we say, it is expected to return fizz if given three, right? That's where the game rules will kick in, wouldn't you say? So, in the expect statement, I would say expect gameplay three to equal fizz, right? As a string, sorry, as a string. And now the problems begin, right? Mm -hmm. This is the test-driven part. Uh, we have a function that apparently meets the requirements for two tests, but we can predict that this test will fail for us because it's logical. Uh, we can run it and we can see that the first two ones are going green, but the third one is, is failing for, for us. And we can say here that there is an assertion error expected three to deeply equal fizz and it you know it, it doesn't right so we can fix that in many different ways i mean one way of of uh, fix, th fixing this is if number equals 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 three uh, that needs to be in parentheses then we would return return fizz uh, else uh, just the block and move this up here and this would work right this would make the test go green right so if I run this now all of them will will pass but this is nonsense of course right because then we would have to code every possible uh, possible solution like three six uh, nine and so on so we don't want to do any of that uh, because uh, this is not what we're looking for what we are looking for is to make use of the module modulus operator do you remember i talked about this guy so uh, what we could say is if number divided by three equals 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 zero right if there's no reminder then we return fizz otherwise we return the number do you understand this is a use case for the modulus operator uh, and this this will actually make our test pass if we pass in three or if we pass in six or nine or whatever that is divisible by three Any questions on that? Well, let's I'm try. assuming we could just I'm assuming we could just do everything with this method, like do an else if for the other um, five and fifteen. Yeah, but 
but we need to hold our horses there. Okay, sorry. Like, no, no, but but you're right. You're totally right. And 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 this is the thing here. This is an exercise, right? At this stage, Kichima, you, you're totally right, and I guess everybody has figured this out. You can use the modulus to to fix the entire algorithm, but but in order to practice test-driven development, we have to be careful. Let's not jump into too many conclusions, right? Uh, we should probably have test cases for for that uh, before we actually make this happen. And even if this might seem trivial. I mean, we all know that you can fix this this way. Let's just fix it and test it afterwards. Sure. But since we want to practice TDD a little bit, then we probably want to, to, to be a bit careful with this. Anyhow, all right. you're I totally see. right. This, the, the modulus will be used for, for, for every test case, for every uh, solution. And I've modified my implementation, and this is, this is correct. Uh, so we could... Just as a sanity check, we can say it should return fizz if given 9, for instance, right? So we can just change this to a 9, and this should still pass. It should give us uh, fizz, and it does, right? So we can, just for the sake of it, because we're doing this in two programming languages, let's head over to the fizz buzz spec. Let's say it is expected... Well, I can copy this from this one. I don't need to rewrite this, the message, right? So it is expected to return fizz if given nine. So I can say expect at game dot play pass in nine and then say dot to equal and then as a string fizz, right? And I'm going to run this this test and it will f complain and we have to read the output it says it expected fizz and it got 9 right so we're just going to jump into the fizz buzz rb the class and just say if and here we don't need all those parentheses because ruby is slightly different uh, so I can do if else, uh, move this number in here, and then say if number number modulus 3 equal equal, we don't use triple equals in Ruby, and then 0, then we say fizz, like this. Again, in Ruby we can omit the return keyword, don't, you don't have to, to have that. And so I run R spec, and both of them are passing for me, right? Okay, so we're gonna stay in the Ruby implementation. We're gonna copy this test because we're a bit lazy, and we will say it is expected to return buzz if given 10, for instance, right? So we're gonna write 10, and this one is supposed to return buzz right because 10 is divisible by 5 we're gonna run this baby and we know it's gonna fail but we're gonna run it anyway it expected buzz but it got 10 which means that we need to go into the the function and then we in Ruby oh sorry we type it up like this else if this it's a Ruby keyword for else if it looks slightly different in uh, in in uh, in JavaScript, we will cover that in just a second. So else if number modulus five equals equals zero, then we just say buzz. Okay, and then we run the test again, and they all go go green for me now, right? Um, and this process cannot be omitted. You need to run the test, you need to see the error message, and you need to read the error message probably, pr properly, and you need to react to it. And I do understand that this is a trivial example, it's just a FizzBuzz kata, we already know the solution to it, but still, th if you want to practice test-driven development, you need to go through the, these tests and maintain discipline. One of the Agile myths is that Agile is not disciplined, uh, I would say it is 
very disciplined because you, you need to stick to this. This is uh, TDD is one of the practices of XP, extreme programming, and you basically need to, to follow the, the, the principles because if you can't do the little things, as this Admiral McRaven said in this, in this now famous talk uh, to the cadets, if you can't do the little things, you won't be able to do the big things, right? So let's implement the same solution in our JavaScript implementation. So we're just gonna, again, a little bit lazy, copy this and modify this to is expected to return buzz if given 10. And we will say that we pass in 10 to this, to this, um, uh, to this function and we want this guy to return buzz. We want to see this fail. So you say yawn test and it, uh, it fails. Go ahead. Yeah, Thomas, would it still be considered TDD and good practice to write the, all the tests first and then start implementing? Oh, or? absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, but I didn't want to do that yet at this stage. No, of course I get it. Uh, I get but, it, but but yeah, and um, I, I was I, I I want to cover that that approach uh, at the end of the thing because yes, that's definitely uh, uh, definitely the case, right? Uh, just just a follow up um, uh, on that one. Uh, do you mean like writing all the tests for the fees buzz and fees buzz then? Yeah implementing yeah okay i, I would I, I have like a yeah i have a reservation about that because uh one principles of tdd should be like you read the test it fails and then you make it green so if you have many tests um written beforehand maybe they will fail and then maybe it's just solving one thing makes them all pass so um it it doesn't cover the yeah i think i hear what you're saying like, mike i hear what you're saying yeah. and I, i'm not surprised that you have that reservation i think it speaks highly of you to to have that i would however um so we we can address that that now i i would say it's totally okay to run many tests uh, to write many test cases but when you actually work with implementing them you should run them one at a time do you understand right uh, i would i uh, I, I might take a slightly other pragmatic view on this, Mike, because I would say that the process of sitting down and writing those tests is an intellectual process that you go through that will help you make a lot of decisions once you are in the flow of writing it blocks and, and assertions and stuff like that. You might as well focus on that and, and, and you know, get it all out. But I would you know, not run them uh, all in one place because then you will A, have too many failures in the beginning, B, you will be unfocused and, and as you say, uh, it, it will potentially give you some false positives at, at some point, uh, you know. So, so I would, uh, I think that, that we, we, we are looking for the same thing here, Mike, but, but we pr perhaps have a slightly different experience of, 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 the, of the process. Does that make sense, Mickey? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, next. Right. And so one thing that um, just to cover what, what Mike just said, like, because you don't want to run too many tests. Now, in our case, all of these are going green. But let's say that I would love to just run this one, this test on line 24. There are different ways to do that. In Mocha, you can say dot only on the it block like, like this. And and just run this test, uh, and then only that particular one will be executed. Do you understand? Like the, the, the others will be omitted. So that's one way of focusing on one test case alone. Uh, Isn't it a way to pass hmm. that in the command line? Once again? Like uh, to pass the, for instance, the line in the command line and it would I think I think there is in Mocha. I, I, I definitely know how to do that in our spec. Uh, in Mocha, I'm not really sure uh, okay. if if we can do that, but we can explore that at some point. Let's see um, if we can we can make this one pass. So we just made it pass in Ruby. So here we would say, uh, 
um, we need to say else if there is no else if uh, command in 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 JavaScript. So here we want to say else if number uh, modulus five equals equals zero, uh, then we return buzz and we format our code like this and this one should probably pass for us now again I do have this only so we only run this particular test and then I want to make sure that everything is well integrated so I remove the dot only and run the tests again and all of them are passing for me now okay now here comes the tricky part of the very non-tricky uh, problem uh, let's head over to now we can stay in this one actually so we can say it is expected to return this dash buzz right that was our example if given f 15 right so we are just gonna pass in 15 and it should return this buzz okay and I'm gonna run only this particular test for for now uh, we're gonna run this and this will fail why would it fail now this is this is the interesting part and this is where most programmers fail and they, when they do this very trivial kata uh, you uh, that's that's exactly what we're doing with only uh, uh, Ethan so 15 is divisible by both 3 and 5 right uh, so in this case this guy is, is returning fizz whereas my test you know wants it to return fizz buzz so let's hear it geniuses let's hear it intelligent people what should I do to this to this uh, very small trivial algorithm to make this this uh, this pass you should add the if at the beginning. And why why at the beginning, Pedro? Uh, because it's the most broad condition. Uh, it's uh, uh, the other way around. It's the most specific condition. Yes. Um, and as such, it won't be captured by the preceding ones. Exactly. Anybody else have a different take on this? Everyone is like, what Pedro said. OK, that's exactly the right, the right uh, answer. Uh, so we need to say if number modulus 15 uh, equals equals 0 then we return return fizz buzz uh, and then we just say else else here right to make this pass yes that's that's perfectly right now I, I, I shit you not, people, that a lot of people come to this 15 example at the very end of the, um, of the kata and they add it here right after buzz, you know, because they don't think, they, they overlook the fact that this is the, the, the most specific one that it needs to be catched before everything else because otherwise... Uh, uh, the shit will hit the fan, and they will not get the job, uh, basically. So this is this is the this is the thing, and this is uh, the right solution, and we should have this one pass for us, right? And then if we just modify modify this spec to run all of them, uh, we should go green on the whole thing, and we are, and we're just gonna swiftly head over to the phase bus spec uh, we're gonna do the same thing here uh, so we're just gonna say phase bus if given 15 and pass this in 15 and we're gonna say phase bus right uh, yeah, Thomas, in, in going back to what you said before, you, you can keep going if you want. <laughs> right. Um, I just want to say that for me, it makes more sense to uh, actually think about the specification of what the code should do and set up the tests 
to test the whole algorithm because otherwise I'm going to go be breaking the the logic process of figuring out the algorithm for me if I'm implementing uh, iterating between implementing and testing straight away. Mm. Right. If that makes sense, it does. It does, and in in certain use cases, I would definitely agree with you, and in others, I wouldn't. So it's a little bit of uh, of uh, you know case by case situation. But in, in principle, I do agree. I, I would say uh, writing writing test cases is is uh, isn't a f a task in itself, right? And when you start thinking about what is my application supposed to do and how should I, how should how should it react? I I don't mind that, but but again, there is a there is a. It's all about the approach later, how you run them and how, what you do to make all of this of all of it pass. I would you know. Um, when I was taught test-driven development, you know, my teacher was very strict. One test, one implementation. One test, one implementation. I was like rebellious, okay. you know. Like, Fuck you! I, I want to, you know, do everything. And 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 you know, I'm a grown-up boy. You know, when I was a kid, I didn't like broccoli, and my mother forced me to eat broccoli. And now I'm a grown-up, and I don't eat broccoli if I don't want to eat broccoli. Fuck it, right? And it's the same thing here. Nobody's standing over my shoulder, and and telling me. When I work, Thomas, don't write two test cases; just write one, uh, because otherwise you're breaking some some uh, conventions. And and I would say that you do whatever works for you, right? Uh, in 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 any given case, the thing is that I'm always looking for the easiest solution and the most unchaotic one, right? If you write too many tests and you run them then you will get all the red output and all the stuff and you will go like ah panic mode uh, it's easier to you know the fewer tests you write that are actually relevant and and you know small iterations basically better that's what i'm talking about yeah that's don't, fair. don't yeah. overdo it basically does that make sense yeah it does definitely. Yeah. do you eat broccoli sometimes yeah so do i actually because I'm a grown-up, I can make my, my, own, my own choice. I'm the master of my own happiness. Uh, so whatever makes you happy, basically, um, I would I would say. Uh, let's see. We should be able to run this somehow, right? Note what I did. Uh, in order to execute one specific line of code in my test file, what I did was I said R spec and then spec fizzbuzz fizzbuzz spec rb back up a little bit say colon and then 23 because my test is on line 23 you understand so in our spec i can do this i can just execute one specific file uh, by pointing our spec to that line of code uh, which is a very convenient way to do this we have to go in here and then i'm just going to change this to else if and then if a number uh, modulus 15 equals equals zero right uh, and then we just say fizz buzz buzz right and does my code formatter work no yes it does good stuff so now I can run this and now we're running going going green I can run the entire test file and it goes green here and just as a sanity check yarn test it goes green too, right? Yes. Okay. So, uh, people, is there any other tests we could we could write? Yes. What if we pass in a string? What if we pass in a negative number? What if we do this and that and so on, right? But we we're not gonna do that. We're gonna stop stop here uh, uh, at this point. And Mike, you should definitely try broccoli at some point, uh, just to uh, you know figure out whether you like it or not uh, and you should write a few test cases at the same time and see if you like that as well if that works for you uh, what did we learn well we learned that everyone has an opinion about testing that's one thing uh, that we also learned in my opinion that coding languages are not at least some of them are not that different from each other 
this FizzBuzz RB implement implementation is not that super different from FizzBuzz in uh, in JavaScript. Uh, we uh, kind of learned that you know the the syntax between uh, RSpec and Mocha is very similar. There is more similarities, more more things that that connect them than what differ them uh, different between them. Uh, there are a few more few more parentheses and and callbacks in 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 the JavaScript implementation in Mocha, but if you can look beyond a few more extra parentheses and the arrow functions, it is pretty much the same thing if you look at the test files and so on. And you can execute them in, uh, in your terminal. And if they work, they are remarkably similar. If they don't work, the, R the RSpec runner is more developer friendly. The errors are, are easier to, uh, to read than the Mocha ones, but the Mocha ones are still understandable if you just take your time to to follow along. What I will do now is to do git status. We can see that there's a, a lot of new files added and some are of the other ones are modified. So I'm just gonna git add everything and git ci, uh, sorry, commit am, uh, no, demo code, demo code for the automated testing session. All tests are green. And green is good, people. Green is good. Um, any questions, any thoughts about this? What... Uh, what do you think? What do you say? What do you hear? You have to start with something, people. Uh, yeah, I think that a, a big project is going to be completely different. It's going to work out completely different. There's going to be, it's going to be a lot of thought process before we even write the tests themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then starting by defining what's the test that we want to pass. Then defining, for instance, those cases that you mentioned that we did not implement. What if the type is not correct? What if mm -hmm. uh, we give a, an invalid number? Um, and coming up with all these edge cases seems to be troublesome in a bigger project. Yeah, it could be. It could be. Uh, I'm actually going to push this up. I'm going to just do git remote add uh origin this and push this up git push origin main and you should be able to access this if you want uh so i'm just gonna paste this uh in both twitch chat and in the uh in the meet chat here so you can if you didn't manage to get all of this to work, you can follow along uh, or read through the code uh, if you want. So we should be, we should have all of this this stuff. You see, I never opened the spec helper people uh, because again, I'm a great fan of uh, doing things as easy as possible. And there is this configuration. This file is auto scaffolded for me when I did run our spec in it. Uh, and I don't have to change anything in this file to make RSpec work for me, but it does come with a lot of a uh, lot of possibilities to modify stuff and, and so on. But you know, again, you have to start with the small things before you move on to more advanced stuff. And I was like, uh, I wasn't really into. Uh, I mean, this is hard enough uh, uh, in the beginning, so we can look at this uh, configuration part at some other. At some other time um, but yeah so did anyone learn anything today oh definitely well, you know, yeah you know the you know the problem i was telling you about the other day with mm -hmm. my application mm -hmm. well yeah i hate to admit it but i probably wouldn't be having that problem if i was testing first 
I, that's like music in my ears, Sima. That's like music in my ears. And and you are probably 100% correct. Uh, so, um, but then again, the the kind of application that you're building uh, is is not easy to test. So, uh, uh, we you know, it's not hard. You know, you can do it, but but it requires a little bit of practice before you can you can get into that. Uh, yeah, it's just annoying because there are just so many things. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Just as a as a kind of a bonus bonus thing, uh, if we uh, if we take a look at a mid-sized project, this is again, this is the project that we codenamed Website One. This is powering the uh, the AgileVentures.org website. Uh, if we take a look at the spec folder, uh, we can see that this particular folder has quite a few uh, subfolders. Right, and if we take a look at the, in this one, for instance, so these are all the tests written for that specific. Uh, these are unit tests for that specific application, and let's see. We take a look at the user class, uh, just to have a look at something, and you can see. Even if though this is these are like much more advanced tests than the ones that we've been writing today. But there are certain similarities. You can see that we're using the describe uh, keyword here. We have our before blocks, sorry. And we have our it blocks, uh, for instance. We have some other it blocks and so on and so on, right? So it, it, it does follow the same structure. And before you know it, if you just practice testing and, and, uh, um, and that flow of, of writing tests before you write implementation, you will be writing these kind of tests as well. Now this is this is uh, uh, this is Ruby, so not not many of you are Rubyists, and you shouldn't be. But uh, I'm just saying that you know you can end up with with uh, this kind of uh, of solutions, right? And if we look at um, at JavaScript tests, we have do have a few of them here. Let's see, JavaScripts, but they are written in. What are they written in? Yeah, this one is is uh, is an older older syntax because we're using the function keyword in in my in my example today. I was using arrow functions, but this is pretty much the same thing. Um, and we're using the scribe and it and so on. These are. Uh, tests that are running Jasmine, which underneath the hood are using Mocha, I think. Uh, so they are pretty much the same thing that we did today, um, but slightly more complicated because it's not a Fizzbuzz kata. This is a real application. Right. So, Thomas. Go ahead. Uh, how far do you think we'll go with tests with the work the web? Do you think we'll also cover fixtures or mocking, or that's beyond the scope and we'll have to do self-study? Nope, you will do a bit of mocking and a little bit of uh, mocking. Definitely spies. Not sure. Uh, they, sp sp um, but we will we will do. Uh, so the most of the testing that we will be doing will be run on uh, on the front end side. And we will be using Cypress to do that. And in Cypress, we 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 have to use a lot of uh, of mock mocks uh, to fake the network calls uh, for when we fetch some data from APIs. Nice. Looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah. The just you know that there was the first international TDD conf recently. I think a week ago when we were doing our thing. Mm -hmm. And I haven't caught up with it, but I watched a few videos and. Uh, some of these experienced testers were also saying it's very good to start practicing with smaller things like what we did today to get in a good habit before you try and write tests for bigger projects. There you go. So I'm actually saying valuable stuff. That's yeah. That's yeah. That's good to get that validation. All right. Um, uh, Thomas, one more thing. Are we going to be doing anything with a, a factory girl or? What's the name? Factory bot. It's called factory bot nowadays for yeah. for Ruby. Um, so, so the answer is yes. Uh, I will show you some examples of factories. Factories are, are uh, just to, to, to inform the others, factories are, are a way to create objects um, in your test environment 
that is where is my yeah there it is right that is very much similar to what we do here in the in the before or in the let um, but using a mechanism that taps in into into the data into a database without actually creating database objects it's it's it calls for a longer explanation than that but but uh, yes we will be using factories uh, at some point both in in uh, in ruby and rails uh, but most importantly in in node.js where where testing is uh, is is uh, not as widely spread as in in the rails world but let me assure you one thing if you're looking for to work as a professional developer and node.js is going to be included in your stack in any way and you know how to test node.js applications you will be very sought after on the job market uh, because that's a that's a skill that not many people have and without beating my own drum i'm actually really good at it uh, so uh, yeah uh, I can teach you some, a few a few tricks that will blow people away, hopefully, uh, if you show them to them. I'm good at Cypress and I'm really good at Node.js. I'm better than most of the other people, I would say, because I actually took the time to uh, to to learn that uh, properly in depth. Uh, so, so yeah. In Rails, testing is is bread and butter. Everybody does it, right? Uh, the only thing that they can differentiate you from from others is good habits, and, and that will actually not be the end of my of my session today or of, of my talk. There is one guy that was one of the signees of the of the uh, Agile Manifesto. Agile Manifesto. Yeah, he was he was Kent Beck. Uh, and he said once, and this is the best quote uh, that that is is re relates to software development. Uh, he was a really good, very talented, very experienced programmer, and he said once that I am not a great coder. I am a good coder with great habits. Do you understand? And that is the 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 biggest takeaway that I want you to to take with you from today's talk it's not about being awesome or a ninja 10x programmer or whatever they the, the schmucks claim in the or are looking for in the in the job ads that you see online or, or in your local newspaper it's about being good but having great habits following having a good discipline and knowing what you want to do that is more than enough if you want to make it in this industry in my opinion so don't be a great programmer, be a good programmer with great habits. Does that make sense, people? Yeah, it does. Yeah. All right. So let's see if we can become good and get ourselves some good habits later on. Thank you very much for today. Uh, I didn't make quite make it into two hours, but nor did I make two and a half. Uh, I made Almost two, two, and a half. two hours and 17 minutes. So... Uh, yeah damn it mm -hmm. too much and never enough all right folks thank you very much and stream thank you for following along if there's anything uh go and visit agileventures.org and jump on the on the wagon of work the web uh program and see if you can become a good programmer with great habits too <laughs>